Hi guys, welcome back to Data Every Day. Um, today we're looking at a data set of Spotify music tracks uh, from 1921 to 2020. So there's 160,000 tracks here and we have a bunch of different um, uh, variables about each track. We have some numericals, some uh, categoricals, and some dummies. Um, so basically uh, what we're going to do is we're going to try to predict the popularity of a given track, uh, which is over here. There's it's a it's in a continuous range, I think, just of integers. Um, but basically, yeah, it, it can go up to it's from zero to a hundred, um, and we're going to try to predict that. Uh, but I'm not going to focus too much on the actual like optimization of the model. Rather, I'm going to show how we can use some um, uh, some methods to. Uh, detect and eliminate outliers from the data. Um, outliers can affect your your model negatively, uh, so I'm going to try to demonstrate how we can use. Um, we, uh, I'll show you some methods for removing them. All right, so uh, we're going to use a linear regression model, uh, and we're going to. I'm actually, yeah, okay, I will scale it. All right, so uh, we're going to use NumPy and pandas for working with the data. Um, we're going to use the stats module from SciPy uh, for uh, detecting the outliers, and I'll explain more about that in a bit. Uh, and then we'll use matplotlib.pyplot and Seaborn uh, to visualize a bit of the data. Um, and we will use a standard scaler and train test split function from sklearn uh, for pre-processing. So I'm going to go ahead and import that, and we'll load in the data with pandas.readcsv. And we can grab the file path over here. The data.csv is the one we're using today. So I'll paste that in and uh, take a look at it. So we have 170,000 uh, rows and uh, 19 columns. Uh, and this is the one we're trying to predict, popularity. So uh, first thing, let's just take a look at some info about the data set. Um, you can tell from here, we have this number of entries and uh, that number appears in all the non-null counts, so we don't have any missing values in this data set. Uh, you can also note we have a few object columns, um, and for today's video, I'm just going to drop them. Um, I've uh, We could find plenty of uh, clever encoding schemes for the artists or for the name, um, but I'm not going to be using them today because I really just want to focus on the outlier detection. So let's go ahead and drop all the unnecessary columns from our data. Uh, data.drop and we're not going to use artists we're not going to use ID uh, we're not going to use the name and we're not going to use the release date uh, the, the reason for that is because we we already have the year and I'm again I'm not really focusing too hard on squeezing every bit we can out of the data set so I'm dropping from axis one, which is the column axis. And now if we look at the info, uh, we see we have a few less, only 14 columns now. Uh, but if we take another look at it, you should see it's all in numeric form. Uh, so it's ready to be used. Um, now let's do the outlier detection. So uh, let's look at the, well, we can look at the data, but really I want to look at the distributions. The I'm going to get box plots for each of the columns. Uh, so we'll use uh, matplotlib and seaborn to generate the box plots. So uh, I'm going to make a new figure uh, with fig size 16 by 10. And then I'm going to plot, because uh, we have 15 columns, I'm going to do it in a 3 by 5 grid. Uh, so for i in range, length of data.columns, so essentially for each column, uh, we're going to create a new uh, pyplot subplot in a 3 by 5 grid indexed by i plus 1. Uh, the plus 1 is because uh, a pyplot requires that it starts at 1 rather than 0, and range starts at 0. Then we'll use seaborn dot, uh, dot box plot, sorry, uh, for data sub and the column that we want is given uh, by data.columns sub i. So this is saying plot a box plot for each column and then we'll show it after that. Um, and here we go. So uh, we can see we have some outliers. Right, so 
Um, when trying to figure out what out what are outliers, it's it's not always so clear cut. For example, uh, well, look, if you if you're not sure what a box plot shows, um, the blue box shows the quartiles. Uh, so, for example, um, what's a good one? Yeah, I'll I'll just use this one. Uh, so this actually uh, I'll use this one. All right. For so this uh, first line here is the first quartile, or that's saying that um, this is where the first 25% uh, of the data is found before uh, before this line. Uh, the line in the middle of the blue box is the second quartile, or the median. And the third line here is the third quartile, or the 75% mark. So um, everything before this line is 75% uh, of the data. And these little whiskers on the edge, these little lines on the outside uh, are showing 1.5 times uh, the first quartile subtracted from the median. So if you take this distance uh, between the first and second quartile, multiply it by 1.5, and then subtract that from uh, the median, actually it might be from the first quartile, uh, then you get this line. And the line really just represents sort of like, uh, I think it's like 95% of the data yeah, is usually um, before the line. So these little dots that appear outside of that of that uh, boundary, right, uh, you can consider as outliers. Now they aren't necessarily outliers. For example, well this is this one's a little interesting, the explicit uh, column. This is just a binary column. So that's not an outlier. Uh, it only takes 0 or 1. So it just decided, well, there's more zeros, so that must be an outlier because it's so far. Um, but it's not, right? This is just a binary column. Uh, but for example, over here uh, in the duration, uh, you can see we have, it looks like a lot of outliers, but then there's this one that's extreme, really extreme. So um, these probably aren't outliers. Because there's so many of them and they sort of taper off like that, these are probably still valid data points. Um, this guy, however, may be a, like a, an anomaly. And um, over here as well, you can see we have a bunch of outliers, uh, but they're not really outliers because there's so many of them and they're concentrated like that. But then this one at the end, we might be able to consider as an actual outlier. But you really, it's not so easy to tell uh, based on the data set. And uh, it does, I don't think there are too many outliers in this data, uh, but we will we will take a f uh, we'll look a little further by creating a function get outlier count and uh, th for this we'll pass in a data frame and a threshold value so the threshold value is a percentage value um, that's it's like a percentile value that's saying uh, how much of the data do we want to accept before we consider out uh, outliers so for example, like, are we going to make the outlier uh, threshold here, or are we going to make it here, or are we going to make it all the way at the end so that only the last one gets cut off? That's what this threshold is going to represent. So I'm going to start by creating a copy of our data frame. And the first thing to do is to get the z-score for the specified threshold. So the z-score. Um, Z comes from the standard normal distribution. So if we look at the normal distribution, uh, this is, let me just make it black, okay. This is the normal distribution, okay. Here's the formula for it right here. Uh, we have a mean, uh, M is mu or the mean, and S is sigma or the variance. So we have a mean and our variance. Uh, and you'll notice uh, if we look at the area under this curve, evaluated from negative infinity to positive infinity, uh, with respect to x, uh, it will always be 1 regardless of what the variance is. Uh, so um, what makes so basically we're going to have our data is going to fit some sort of uh, distribution. Um, so this is assuming it's normal. It may not be normal, but we're, we're sort of making that assumption here. Um, and so let's say our data looks something like uh, like this. Like let's say this is, this is the this is what our data distribution looks like. This is um, basically what the z-score is. 
is it's saying, okay, let's apply a shift and a scale to our data, and then take a look at it um, in the, as a standard normal. Standard just means we have uh, zero mean and one variance. And then we're going to uh, basically identify outliers based on how far they are away from the mean. So the threshold now comes uh, somewhere along this distribution. Do we want to make the cut here or here or here or here? But at some point we want to identify everything past the threshold as outliers. Um, so the z-score is actually the x value here. Um, well, maybe it might be easier to see it as the cumulative distribution. Let me let me show you what I mean. Okay, well, let's just actually just get the z-score. So we can get it from scipy.stats.zscore. Um, but actually, it might be better if we do stats.norm. So this is the normal distribution. And we can get the um, CDF, which is the uh, cumulative distribution for the normal. Uh, so basically, we pass in a value, uh, let's say zero, and you'll see 50% of the data uh, is um, has been lies uh, before the zero value. So that means that at the zero value, because this is on the x-axis, we pass in zero, we get 50%, because you can see 50% of the data uh, has been accepted. Then as we move up, let's say we do 0.5 instead, uh, we get 69%. Uh, That's because by, by this point, uh, everything that comes before it uh, is 69% of the data. As we keep moving up, let's say to 2, so we'll pass in 2 here, we get 97, because at 2, 97% of the data has been passed. So let's say we want to go really far, all the way to 3, let's say even 4. If we pass 4 in, you'll see 99.99996% has passed. So that's because the almost the entire distribution has been um, accounted for already. So um, what are the z-scores here? So basically, uh, we're going to get a z-score for every value in our data frame. So let's look at the data frame here. Uh, each one of these values has a z-score with respect to its column, right? So if we arrange the all the the values in the column as uh, a normal standard normal, then we can assign a z-score to each uh, value in um, based on where it is in the distribution. And the z-score is actually the x-coordinate here. Uh, so what we can do we take the inverse of the CDF, which here is called the PPF, and I believe that stands for, let me, let me look it up, stats, uh, we can get the normal, should be right down here, yeah, norm, uh, and it says PPF percent point function. So this is the inverse of the CDF, or the percentile uh, function. Uh, and basically, this allows us to pass in a percentage value Let's say we pass this one in, and we should get back four. So it's the inverse. This one, we pass in a percent, uh, like how, how far along, how much of the data do we want to accept, and it will return the x value, which is the z-score. Uh, so as this go, comes closer, let's say 50%, uh, that's actually zero, because, um, sorry, here, uh, the 50% mark on the in terms of how much distribution we have is the zero on the x. So um, we can use right. So we can use this x, this uh, z-score uh, as the, the cutoff point. So uh, what we want to do is take this threshold we pass in. We're going to pass in a threshold like this, and we're going to get the z-score for the specified threshold. So we can use stats.norm.ppf to get that. We pass pass in threshold, and then uh, we can return. So I'll call this threshold z-score. And we can return it to see how that works. Um, so this is going to do exactly the same thing that I did right here. Get outlier counts. And we're going to pass in 0.95. Oh, what happened? 
Oh, sorry, I've had to pass in data. All right. Uh, and wait, what is what is this? Why is it returning all this stuff? Should just return. <laughs> wait a minute. If I run this, oh yeah, what? Oh, I'm sorry. I'm passing it into the wrong function. <laughs> okay. There we go. Uh, so now we pass in the data frame. Uh, we're not actually using the data frame yet. Just just right now, this is returning the actual z-score for a given threshold value. So um, as we go closer and closer to getting all the data, you see the, the z-score keeps going up um, because we're getting uh, farther and farther to the right over here. Um, so now what's, what we should do is get the z-scores uh, for each value in the data frame, so in df, and compare them to the threshold. So this is where we're actually checking for outliers. We're saying, uh, okay, we have, we're going to get some z-scores for, for these values, and then compare it with the threshold value, and if it goes past the threshold, we're going to consider it an outlier. Uh, so what I'll do, uh, we'll have an outlier data frame that's going to, uh, okay, so let me just note, we can use the stats.zscore, uh, we can pass in the data, and then it will return the, the z-score for each one. So uh, if I turn this back into a data frame, and I use, uh, I can use the data's column names as the columns. Uh, you can see uh, this is a data frame, but all the z-scores are now plugged in, right? Uh, so if a single one of these z-scores goes over our threshold z-score, uh, we, we know that we can consider that an outlier. Um, so let's use this in here. Uh, instead of data, it will be df. So here is this sort of outlier data frame. It's the data frame of all the z-scores. Now, why don't we call it z-score df? And then uh, we're going to return the count of outliers in each column. So uh, we're going to take the z-score df, and element-wise, we're going to check uh, if it's greater than the threshold z-score that we calculated already. Uh, and we can return that instead. Yeah, let's just return this. Um, and now you'll see uh, it actually, um, it's so right now it's returning a true or false value for each element based on if this z-score has gone over the limit. Um, however, we have a, one problem, which is that we have negative values in here. And we don't only want outliers on the right to be considered. We also want outliers on the left, because if it's really far on this side, we also want to consider that as, um, as a uh, outlier. So a simple fix for this is just uh, when we get the uh, z-scores for, uh, for the column, like this, we'll just, instead of taking the z-scores, we'll take uh, the absolute values of the z-scores. So it looks like this. They're all, uh, basically now, they're a measure of um, extremeness away from the mean. Uh, so we can just plug that in here, absolute value. And uh, now a single one of these true or false will let us know if we have an outlier. So if we make this really low, let's say 50%, we should get a bunch of trues because they're all um, they're all now considered outliers because our threshold is so low. If we bring it up, you see we have a few, um, but most of them are false. And the higher we go with the threshold, uh, the fewer and fewer we will have. And if eventually, if we have a long enough one, we all have none at all. Uh, so the last thing to do is instead of returning this true or false data frame. Let's return the sum of it. 
So I'm going to sum over axis 0, which is the row axis. So it will sum downwards. And that will give us a count for each column of how many trues we have. And now we can see the number of outliers we have in each column. Uh, so this function right here is basically takes in a data frame and a threshold and gives us the outlier counts in each column uh, based on what we provided. So let's bring this down like 50%. You see we have, uh, in fact, every one of them is considered an outlier now. Uh, as we bring this up, we have fewer and fewer and fewer and fewer. And so now we it's a, it's sort of a test of uh, which one is what what's the best threshold to use to optimize the performance of our model. And so we're going to come back to this. Um, first, we want to make another function called uh, remove outliers. So this is going to take in also a data frame and a threshold. Uh, and it's going to start off very similar to this one. So I'll just copy this, paste it in, and I'll modify it. Uh, so the difference here is instead of just getting the counts, we actually want to eliminate them from the data frame. So at the end, uh, this is going to return uh, the original data frame, but with some modifications. So that's why I uh, made a copy at the beginning, so that we're not actually modifying in place, but we are uh, modifying a fresh copy. So this starts off the same way. We're going to get the threshold z-score. Then we're going to calculate uh, the z-scores of every element in the data frame. Um, and then we're going to, wait, I, we didn't actually compare it up here, right? We compared them down here. OK, that's fine. Uh, why don't I do it this way? I'll say, compare df z scores to the threshold and return the count of outliers in each column. All right, and now here, so here we're getting the z, uh, z score for the threshold, the z scores for the data frame, and instead of returning now the counts, we're going to uh, get the indices of the outliers. Um, so Let's see. If I take this, uh, oh, I already have that there. Um, instead of summing over axis 0, which means summing down, we can sum over axis 1, which means summing across, uh, which will basically count up the number of outliers in each row. Uh, and if this is greater than 0, which means if a given row has at least one outlier, we can consider that as an outlier example and just drop that row. So what I'll do is I'll call this outliers, and this is going to be uh, all of our actual outlier rows. Um, so let's see, how should I do this? OK, I guess we should do here, just take the z-score df. Uh, and set it equal to this. So uh, we're just going to tra uh, change it into a Boolean DF instead. Uh, and then we'll get the outliers by summing the z-score DF over axis 1 first. OK, so let's just return outliers for now so we can see what this is doing. Remove outliers uh, with passing in data and 0.95 z-score is not defined. Oh yeah, wait. What do you mean z-score is not defined? Outliers equals should be z-score df. Okay, so this is giving a count of outliers in each row. Uh, if we don't sum, you'll notice this is returning this true-false thing again. So now we're summing uh, over axis. If we sum over axis 0 like we did before, it'll give us just the same thing. Uh, but now instead we're going to sum over axis 1, which will give us the number in each row. And so now we check, um, we'll say outliers equals out, outliers greater than, one, than 0. So this will be a true or a false if there's a given outlier in, in, a, in a row. Sorry, if there's an outlier in a given row. 
So uh, the higher this goes, the fewer we'll have. Uh, you can see we only have one there, and eventually we'll have none remaining. Actually, I have to work a little harder to get rid of that one. Okay, he's gone. Um, all right, so now last step. Uh, let's get the indices of all these. So uh, we can actually use this Boolean series as an indexer for outliers, uh, actually for DF. So we're going to take the data frame that we're passing in, which is data, uh, and we're going to take its index. So data.index looks like uh, this. It's, a, just a, it's actually just an, a range index. It starts from zero, stops at the max index value. Uh, so that's, that, that's this thing on the side. And we can index it based on these true and falses. We can sort of like use uh, the, the trues in there to get the indices that we need. Um, I think, for example, if we pass in, uh, no, I forget it, forget it. <laughs> but um, okay, how about this? I'll use this as the indexer, right? So data dot index sub the the output from this thing will actually give us the indices of all the trues in here. So we're plugging in for the index uh, outliers, right? So this looks like this. We're plugging it into the index to return the actual index values for the outliers. So I'm going to call this outlier indices. And then, uh, so I could return outlier indices just to show you what it does. And that will give us the actual index values of all the outliers in the data. But I want to remove them. So drop outlier examples. Uh, here we'll drop the indexes from axis zero. DF equals DF dot drop outlier indices. Axis zero means the row axis. And anytime we're dropping rows, it's a good idea to reset the index afterwards, just so that it, it uh, we don't have missing indices, right? Uh, if you want to retain the indices for some purpose, that's uh, you wouldn't want to reset it here. Uh, and we'll pass in drop equals true prevent the old indices, the uh, miss, like the out-of-order indices, uh, from being uh, added as a new column. So now instead of this, we're going to return DF after the indices have been dropped. And now you'll see uh, we have fewer examples. If we look at our original data uh, right here, wait, let me bring it down one more. Here's our original data. Here's our new data with the in, with the outliers removed. We have fewer examples, um, and let's say we actually let's say we remove all the uh, if we if we set the threshold all very low, uh, we'll have no values at all. If we bring it up, we still have none. At point eight, we have only 1,100. Um, so these are the ones that are really close to the mean. We go up to point nine. We have uh, 16,000, uh, then we bring it up to 0.95, uh, we're at 73,000, 0.995, we're up to 139,000. Uh, so the closer this gets to 100%, uh, the more of the data we retain. So now we can use this to try to figure out what the best um, data set is to use based on what outliers to keep. So now let's uh, make a pre-processing function. So uh, we'll make we'll get the data now ready to be fed into the model. So I'm going to get a function preprocess inputs that's going to take in a data frame, and we'll have a boolean flag called outliers. By default, we'll have it on true, and this will be telling us whether or not we want to keep outliers in the data set or not. And we'll also have a threshold, which by default will be 0.95, uh, which will only be used if outliers is false. So we'll start by creating a copy of our data frame, as usual. And then if outliers equals false, uh, so it means if we don't want to keep outliers, then we're going to remove the outliers. df equals remove outliers, that's the function we wrote. That's going to take in df and the threshold specified here. OK, uh, then we're going to split uh, the y and x apart. So y is what we're trying to predict. That's popularity. Uh, so y equals uh, df sub popularity, and we'll make a copy. x equals df dot drop 
popularity from axis one, and we'll make a copy. And then we're going to use the train test split function from sklearn to split into train and test sets. So x train x test y train y test equals train test split x y. Uh, we're going to include a train size, which is how much of the data we want in the train set, 70%. And a random state, um, this is included because uh, this function actually shuffles the data also. So the random state will ensure that the shuffle and the split is always made the same way. And then uh, after that, so let me just comment these a little, split df into x and y, and y. that's not the right one, that should be here. And then here, train test uh, split. And here, remove outliers if uh, specified. And then last, we're going to scale the data. Uh, scale x uh, with a standard scalar. So a standard scalar is going to, uh, it'll perform a shift in scale like we saw with the uh, calculating the z-score, um, but it'll actually apply it to the data. So it's going to give each column a mean of 0 and a variance of 1. Uh, so scalar will be a standard scalar. I imported that from sklearn. And we're going to fit the scalar to the train set only. And we're going to transform both the train and test sets with the fit from just the train set. So x train equals scalar dot transform x train. And we'll apply the same transform to the test set. All right, and then we'll return x train, x test, y train, and y test. All right, so let's actually get those values. Um, yeah, so. I'll let me just get them. Pre-process inputs. Passing in here uh, data. And we're going to keep outliers on true. We're going to keep the outliers in here. Oh, actually, no, we'll keep it on false. So we'll remove outliers. And we'll specify a threshold as well. Keep it as the default value for now. Then I want to create a separate uh, for data sets like this, except I want to keep outliers true. So we're going to have one where we have outliers, uh, which is this one, and then one where we have removed the outliers. So the one with outliers, I'll call outlier x train, outlier x test, outlier y train, and outlier y test. All right, so now we have eight different sets of data. Uh, four of them have outliers, four of them do not. And then we will begin training. So I'm going to create two models, uh, one that will be fit to the outlier data, one that will be fit to the reg uh, uh, to the non-outlier data. So with outliers, uh, we'll have our, mo our, we'll call it outlier model. And so this is our, our model that has the outliers in the data. And that will just be linear regression, just keeping it simple today. And then uh, outlier model dot fit. So if, uh, fitting on not x train but outlier x train and outlier y train. Uh, then we will get the outlier model accuracy uh, given by outlier model dot score. Uh, and we're scoring on the outlier x test, outlier y test, uh, test set. All right, and we can print it out. Test accuracy, outliers. Uh, let's format the string with, uh, we'll display the outlier value, uh, the accuracy value to five decimal places with a percent sign, dot format, passing in here, outlier model ac, and I'm going to multiply by 100 so we get in percent form. All right, so this is this is our percent our accuracy with outliers. 75%, uh, so not bad. Now let's see how using uh, the out the remove outliers function that we had uh, affects the performance. So let's copy this, and this will be without outliers. And I'm just going to remove all the outliers from this. So we're just we're just going to call it model, 
and we're going to train on the normal X train Y train and evaluate it on the normal X test Y test. So this will just be model.score and model accuracy and uh, in the end we're going to uh, show it without or actually no outliers. Okay, uh, we have a severely reduced performance. And the reason for this is our threshold is way too low. We're classifying way too much of the data as outliers, and we're actually just depriving the model of seeing more useful data. Um, so let's go back up here. If we're using 0.95, you can see how much of the data we're getting rid of. Uh, this is the, the count of outliers in each column if we use a threshold of 0.95. We're going to need something that's a lot uh, higher on the threshold uh, value. So 0.99. Uh, let's see if that in improves it. So over here, we're just going to create the. We're going to use the preprocess inputs, but with a different threshold, and then we can retrain this. Okay, it went up a little. Um, let's see if. Oh, actually, let's remove this. So let us see. Hold on, I just want to move this around a little. Bring this back here, I guess. Okay. So let's see if we bring if we put another nine in there. Alright, that's looking better. Let's let's use that uh, over here. And see how that goes. So uh, seventy two point five, that's getting closer to our value. And you'll see this will always be the same, right? But uh, so we want to keep sort of raising this threshold value. Let's put another 9. And we're having even less. So we'll add another 9 here and here. And you see we're getting closer. Now the challenge is, are we ever going to pass it? Are we going to get better performance uh, with a certain threshold? Um, so let's see, where, where is it? Over here. Let's Let's put like three more 9s. Now we have uh, very few, okay? So we're going to add three more nines to here. And take a look. And we're getting closer and closer. Let's add two more nines. See how it goes. And we're adding it to here as well. Oh, I didn't check this. All right, so we have only two columns now that have any. Uh, let's see how that does. Oh, we're almost there. We're at 0 0.8, and this is at 0 0.9. So we're almost there at... Uh, improving the model's performance. So let's add one more 9 here. Uh, now we have even fewer. And another 9 here. And we have surpassed. We have surpassed the model performance. We now have a better performing model with no outliers based on the uh, very high threshold. Uh, so let's see if we add even more, if we can get even better performance. I'm going to add one more and check. And we do have a better performance. Let's add one more. And check. Oh, actually, I don't think I added one. And it went down. So let's remove one. And so it looks like this is the optimal threshold, the optimal value. So we're going to use that uh, over here and see what that looks like. So we're removing 404 uh, values uh, and 16 values here. So I don't know if they're in the same rows or not. How many do we end up dropping? Uh, it doesn't really matter. What matters is we found the optimal threshold. Uh, we may even be able to specify it even better by putting in like a few more d lower decimals there. Let's see, can we? If I do eight, no, that br brought it down. Uh, seven. Wait, why is this affecting it so much? Oh, I think I removed a nine. Nope. Okay, okay. So even adding one here, that brought it down. So change this to an eight. Let's see how, did that go up or down? It went down. So this is the, this seems to be the best. Uh, we may even be able to do zeros or something. I'm not going to go that far. Uh, but so we found the optimal threshold and I guess that will sum up today's video. Uh, I may have taken too long to explain all this stuff, but uh, hopefully you have a better understanding now of uh, why we can uh, like why the z-score thing works uh, with the graph uh, and hopefully that will allow you to 
uh, do your own outlier detection uh, in your own work. So thank you so much for watching the video. Um, I hope you liked it. If you did, make sure to subscribe and uh, hit the bell for more content and leave any comments you have in the section below. I'll see you guys tomorrow. Have a fantastic day.